Okay, here is another PowerPoint. This is Introduction to Alaska Archaeology Part 2. So, you also need the, to know the difference between observation and inference. An observation is something that you can see and describe, but what's an inference? Well, an inference is an educated guess. So, what you need to understand is a lot of the stuff that you see on television pertaining to archaeology is inference. Because they don't know. So, how would you make an observation about this object, right? You could say that it's serrated on the edges, meaning that it's kind of worked on, along the edges. It has two holes drilled into it. And if you felt it, you'd know it's thin and lightweight. But inferences would be, is it an owl? Was it worn as a pendant? And so understand that as an archaeologist, you have to use inferences, but as a student, you really need to understand the difference because this affects the stuff that you see on TV, the stuff you read in the newspaper, and the stuff you see in magazines. Now, I'm going to give you very, very basic information about dating. So, and we're not talking about Match.com. We're talking about how do archaeologists determine the age of specific objects. So does anyone know the two main categories of dating? If you don't, you should know one is relative and one is absolute. Now, I'm going to talk about relative dating. That's why you have a picture of a redneck wedding. Ha, ha, ha. Relative dating. Never mind. And the main example of relative dating is stratigraphy. Basically, you've all seen stratigra stratigraphy. Stratigraphy is just when somebody digs a hole into the ground. You'll see different color earth. And those different colors pertain to different time periods in the Earth's history. So, stratigraphy is just looking at different layers of soil deposition. But it gives us some insight into time. The other main form of radiocarbon, of absolute, of the main other category of dating, as I said, is absolute. The main form is radiocarbon dating. Now I want to go back for a second to the relative dating. So the main category is stratigraphy. Now I can't put a little pointer on it, but just think of um, you see different layers, and if you look at the layers in front of you here on the picture, let's say there's an artifact where it says silver sand, and then there's another artifact where it just says sand in that layer. Okay, do you know the exact dates of those artifacts? No, but what you do know is the dates in relation to one another. So again, we're saying that one, the one on the bottom is probably older than the one on the top. So you're dating something in relation to something else. That's why it's called stratigraphy. With the radiocarbon dating, now they've gotten away from calling it absolute because what you'll see with these dates, especially when we talk about these old sites, is that there are ranges of 10,000 years, 15,000 years, and the farther you go back in time, sometimes we're talking a million. So they're not real absolute dates, but it's better than stratigraphy, better than relative dating. At least you're getting some kind of number. And so for our purposes, like I said, just so you understand the differences. The other thing that you're going to see sometimes when you do reading is that they're no longer using, you know, like 2000 BC or AD. Okay, just when you see BCE or BP after a date, 
they're getting away from the Christian driven dating system. Good, bad, or indifferent, that's just the way things are going. Um, and, you know, and if you think about it, let's say everything was dated BB and AB, before Buddha and after Buddha. You know, if you're not a Buddhist, that's not going to mean a whole lot. So, again, um, I don't make these things up. And when you see BCE, it's just going to mean before the common era or BP before present. So, again, they're just trying to get away from the Christian connotation. Okay, a couple of other things I wanted to talk about is archaeology in Alaska. But before we do, I just wanted to talk about a paradigm really fast. So what is a paradigm? Does anybody know? You really should know this if you want to impress your employer, your educators, your girlfriend, whatever. So you can look up the definition. Um, the way I describe a paradigm is just a way that individuals in a given field look at a particular subject. A long time ago, if you were an alcoholic, the paradigm was more, more of a moral paradigm when I was growing up. So if somebody had an alcohol problem and they had to go to rehab, guess what? Their family didn't say they went to rehab. They said they're going to visit their Aunt Jenny or whatever. Because it was a moral paradigm, it meant the person was weak, you should be ashamed of them, they should be ashamed of themselves. Now, it's a medical paradigm. So now, it's not a big deal, you know, everybody and their brother goes to rehab. And so now it's like, well, okay, if you have a sickness, alcohol is like a sickness, drug addiction is like a sickness, and you just go get help just like you would for any other sickness. So that's really taken the stigma off of it. What does this have to do with Indiana Jones? Well, just so you know, archaeologists hate Indiana Jones because he represents everything that archaeology is not anymore. He represents the old paradigm. The old paradigm was antiquarianism, meaning interest in everything old. You've all seen the movies. Was he interested in documenting every single artifact in relation to everything else. And don't forget, he was just interested in the most expensive, the coolest, the neatest. Now the paradigm is reconstruction. We want to reconstruct how people live. We just don't want to come in and take the best thing, and that's it. So now, because we're using more of a jigsaw puzzle analogy, Every artifact is important in relation to everything else. All right, so remember the new paradigm is reconstruction. Why is Alaska one of the most important places archaeologically on the planet? Now you should know this, but if you don't have an anthropology background, I could understand why you wouldn't. Just so you know, it is because it's where the Bering Land Bridge theory started. So what's the Bering Land Bridge theory? If you don't know, here's a picture of Beringia. Beringia is in the, the darker orange. And so basically, what we know is that way back when the seas receded and all of that area that was orange was actually land. And so the theory is that the way North and South America were populated was because of Beringia and because of the people migrating across it. Did they know they were crossing a bridge? Of course not. But they were just following the big game, like the mammoths, like the mastodons. And just so you know, there's no doubt that Beringia existed. Um, for a long time, by about the, I want to say by about the 1920s, everyone figured out, or scientists figured out, how most of the world had been populated. But the big enigma was how North and South America were populated, or the New World. So there were all kinds of outrageous theories, the lost tribes of Moses, um, people from the lost continent of Atlantis, so no one knew. 
And by the 1950s, they looked at geological information. They looked at um, paleontological, you know, the extinct species of animals. Um, they looked at genetics. They looked at blood typing of the different native groups. They looked at botany. So no one's denying that it existed. The, the question comes in, okay, how did North and South America get populated? So according to this theory, the seas receded, people were migrating from Asia across Siberia into Alaska, some stayed, some left, and that's how North and South America became populated. Um, and so here you have that surmised again. If that's the case, then where would you find the oldest sites, right? If everybody migrated across the Bering Land Bridge, you would find the oldest sites in Alaska, correct? And then, you know, some people stayed and some people get going, got, kept going. Unfortunately, we have some issues. So from about the 1950s up until the last 10 years, um, that's what everybody thought. Okay, Bering Land Bridge theory, yay, we got it. Um, case closed, that's how North and South America were populated. Unfortunately, since that time, in the last 10 years, they have found old sites, especially one, Monte Verde, and we'll talk about this when we talk about North America. Um, they found it in, in Chile the bottom of Chile, 40,000 years old, and a place called Meadowcroft Rock Shelter near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. That's a lot older than anything we find in Alaska. So just when they started finding these sites, it really invalidated the Bering Land Bridge theory, unfortunately. So that's why Alaska is so important right now, because we're having to rethink how North and South America were populated. And it was also thought that the earliest people were these people called the Clovis Paleo-Indians, um, which we'll get to in the next slideshow, but they were the ones who supposedly did all this migrating and killed the mammoths and all that. So when all this new stuff surfaced, in all kinds of magazines, there was who, who were the first Americans then, um, you know, how how was North and South America populated? So this became a really big deal. Here's another one. So we're going to talk about this as we go. Just understand that it has been invalidated, or parts of it have been invalidated. We're having to rethink how we came up with it. And now to kind of explain the older sites in South America and some old sites on the East Coast, this is kind of a new mapping of how they think North and South America were populated, but understand we're still trying to figure this out. So you'll see the next slideshow and it'll go into a little bit more detail about this.